Good morning, everybody. Today is Friday. I hope you've had a good Friday. By the time you see this video, it's either did or didn't. Uh, a lot of things planned this weekend. Trying to cover these saws. But there's something I want to cover first. With talking to people, whether it be on the phone or emails, questions in the comments, there seems to be this rash, now I don't call it misinformation, but if you ask me a question about what I personally think, be careful what you ask. I'm going to tell you a straight answer. I'm going to. Let's talk about case volumes, good or bad. Let's dispel one little myth right here. There's a lot of people out here on YouTube and in the world that's not on YouTube. They're excellent saw builders, excellent. Well, when you go on to forums and you talk to this guy and you come listen to me and you go to this other guy and you're trying to sort this out, it gets difficult and I know it does. The only thing I can share with you from my knowledge is what's from my experiences and I can tell you where I got it from case volumes there is this myth smaller case volumes are better for a chainsaw than large case volumes okay let, let's let's look at this analytically let's really take that apart when these manufacturers build these saws, they have a general, safe, easy-to-operate build that you as a consumer want to buy and run because of no, number one, reliability. Okay, They want you to have reliability. They want you to have their tech support. They all are competing to build a good saw that's going to last you. I, I would hope that's still that way. I, I mean, I, let's just go down that slippery slope. Okay. Most chainsaw cranks are not full circle. Meaning, they have just a counterweight. Like the 576 and uh, one thing that the Huskies are full circle cranks. That means this continues all the way around, okay? Hence, giving it less case volume. Um, the, the factory guys miss sometimes too. So don't we, we do. We have problems. We have problems building these saws. When you take a power saw and you kind of go the wrong direction to try to get, enhance an ability, uh, uh, you can get into this real trap of thinking backwards. Bigger case volumes will always produce more high-end torque and horsepower. Let's say your saw runs 12,000. A lot of them run up there to 14. Let's say it runs 12,000. Peak. It backs off to about 10.5 in the cut. You don't want the peak torque to be down at 5,000. One way to move that peak torque around is alter your case volume. Okay? Now, I'm going to give you a reason why. These motor motorcycle manufacturers, for, let's talk motocross bikes. They have a full circle crank, middle of the road case volume. They want it to scream like the wind on the top end. A like, good example, YZ250, always been a strong crazy nuts bike great 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 motocross great trail bike just depends on what transmission gearing you got great trail bike got it down low got it up high perfect okay it's middle of the road a long time ago i happened to be around a major builder that was building motocross bikes for team yamaha and he was showing me their cases and their cranks Oh, it was full circle. The diameter of the circle was much smaller and lighter. 
real lightweight flywheel. Large case volume. They did everything they could to extend that case volume. I says, why is that? Because we don't care if it puts down low. This is a race bike, full bag race bike. We want it. All the way at the top, this engine is going to run peak RPM all the time. That's where we want it. So we increased the case volume. Well, at the time, I was building an awful lot of race V8s. Big blocks, small blocks, didn't matter. Uh, I built a lot of them, and I'm very successful at it. Well, think about this. Case volume, if you're trying to go down that slippery slope to compare four-stroke automobile engines to a chainsaw, this is a really hard one to do. But let me break it down. When you put a big cam, high compression, in a small block Chevy and balance it, you got domes like this, big heads, a lot of air flowing in on the intake and the exhaust. Are you going to run a factory intake, the small volume, or are you going to run a big high rise? Don't worry, am. Anything, you're going to run the big intake, more volume. In relationship with a chainsaw, the same thing applies. You're moving air and fuel, okay? And we alter our intake timing, in some cases the transfer timing, and we alter the exhaust timing to build that racing cam into this motor. No, they don't lope. It'd be kind of neat if they had two-stroke loped when you did that. They don't. Actually, uh, when you get to sweet spot, they idle smoother. That's unique, isn't it? Because we've increased the efficiency. But when you work on your transfers, make them big here, taper them down to just a little smaller here and put them out these transfers you build a tunnel ram right inside them transfers in the quad loop you can do it even in this design here uh that's a steel 66 by the way you get the same thing applies you just go about a little different but let's just talk quad loop right now let's make it simple as a 372 by the way um the case and the transfers are like your intake manifold. You have a carburetor feeding the case volume and the transfer volume. At low RPMs, it's too big. It loses flow. I don't run my saws at 4,000 RPMs or 5 or 3. They'll still idle awesome. But they don't have that power down low. I don't know anybody that commercially runs their saw anywhere but right on a peg on a peak RPM all the time. Bigger case volumes. Is there a lot of difference? Oh, no. There's not a lot. But there's just enough. What are you looking for? What's your expectations? What are you trying to build? Are you trying to build a serious log and saw? I build serious logging saws. I do not claim to build hot rod, mad, crazy, stupid saws. Uh, they're just toys to me. But we're going to get into that, aren't we? Yes, we are. As soon as the dust settles down, I get a few more saws built. I got time for me. We're going to get into the exotic. But let's cover the simple basis first so we understand what we're dealing with. So... In the case of the 576, I've been talking to Tin Man about them, full circle cranks. I'd like to see what one did without being full circle. I want, I want that removed. I want to see what it does with that shape crank, a 576. I tend to believe that the windage off the crank as it rotates, the air has a tendency to be forced up out of the case right here and into the transfers. 
I'm not saying that it's a massive amount. I'm saying that that hair, air has to go somewhere and it has to come off of the faces right here. And some of it's going to go this way, but you got the rod obstructing it. More is going to go this way, which has to go up the transfers. This is minimal, but it does exist. Full circle crank, it's my thought. It creates just a turbulence. Think about what I'm saying. Let's talk about your box fan. It's got like five, six blades on it. There's an open area between them. It builds pressure. Right? Now, what if all them blades between them was solid? Like a full circle crank. What's that going to do? I know we're going to get into a whole lot of theory there. Because there's some smart people out there. Say, so, well, that's not the principle of a box fan. How can you compare it to a crank set? Well, you can't. But let's dumb this down to a common level so we can understand that there's things you can do to make this air go up this transfers with larger case volumes. One thing that would help, and I don't do this often, instead of being flat across with a sharp corner, what if you took and cut them at an angle from here to here, right across there like that? The leading edge of that is going to have a tendency to push the air sideways, right? Yes, that's just one thing. Um, it's going to help. But in the cases to do that, this is the, the intake side. This is exhaust side. Right here, you would have to have a little bit of a dam to help ca capture that. At probably the same angle as you cut on your crank, but the opposite direction. That will help force that more up to that primary. Okay. So then you would have to concentrate on getting your secondary filled too. Okay, I'm going to get into this whole big thought, and I don't want to do that. I'm just trying to, I'm trying to tell you that when it's discussed about case volumes, yes, case volume reduction will make low-end torque. I don't care. It's a dang chainsaw. I want it all up on top, everything. There. I want large case volumes. That's for me. You do what you want. Anybody that wants to argue that anymore, I don't want to hear it because I know there's more than one way to skin a cat, so to speak, okay? I know that. I've been doing this an awful long time. It's pretty hard to, to get one over on me, but that one there is one that sticks in my craw. Um, yeah, I reduced case volume and... Uh, to the point, far enough, I actually killed the damn saw off. So I learned that one. I've opened them up as far as I possibly could and haven't had them do anything negative. So there's got to be a fine balance. There's got to be a fine balance of what you're trying to accomplish. You are trying to get air through your carburetor, down in that case and up them transfers and out above that piston and fire it. And you want just as much air as you can get. When you look how many times a second a chainsaw actually fires, what you think about airflow going slow, throw it right out the window. Don't even... You got to understand what the real picture is. This air is going in two directions damn near at the same time. It is. A chainsaw is nothing but a piss poor air pump. It's blowing and sucking out the exhaust. It's trying to blow back out the intake. The only thing that stops it is your piston skirt closes quick enough. Uh, that I got a 160 degree rule. Never exceed 160 degrees of total opening. People ask, Harv, what 
degrees do you open your intake? I can't tell you that. I can't. Bore stroke combinations, rod ratio, your rod ratio, your pin, your pin height and your piston makes all the difference in the world, subtly. But if you start stacking up three or four or five or six little losses or gains, if they all stack one way, you machinists understand this, don't you, about tolerance, you can have five facets that are uh, machined within tolerance. You stack it all up, and you're out of tolerance as an end result, right? Bill Block understands that. I know he does. There's a bunch of you that do. Same thing with these power saws. My intakes, I measure, not by a degree of opening because of these anomalies, how... When does it open? When does it close? How many degrees total is that uh, able to draw? When your piston is on its way up, okay, that's when you draw air into your case. Well, it doesn't start instantly. The piston's got to move a bit. It opens. Then you start going around your degree wheel. One of these little buggers. And you figure out how many degrees that stays open before it closes. Okay? So what happens is on the way up, it's drawing air fuel in. It fires. Piston comes down quite rapidly. And shuts the air intake off through the carburetor. I really like to see 153 to 155 degrees on most saws. If I'm starting to get stratospheric compression, I'll push that. I'll push that to 158, 159. But you'll find out that when you initially start porting, be a little conservative of your intake timing, total degrees of rotation. Exhaust. If you ported every saw you did, it opened at 100 degrees. Every time you're going to have an awesome running saw. Every time. It's going to be just nice. But you have to open your transfers up. I know these people doesn't do that. These people don't do that either. Good. Don't encourage them. There's going to be points that I'm going to start going to shows where these people are and they're and just with a common logging saw. If they have an honest build, they're going to see with their own eyes that this is true. This is absolutely true. I know this video isn't for everybody. I understand that. But for those of you out there that's trying to understand how these engines work, I'm trying to give you what I figured out. Am I right about everything? Probably not. Um, are other people that's building it different ways right? Very likely. Like I said, there's more than one way to skin a cat. There really is. You can ultra raise your compression. Use relatively slow exhaust numbers. You lose on your real late exhaust opening. But you gain on your compression. At some point, that kicks in. It really does. So then you have to concentrate on your intake. And you'll get this to run all right. It's just hard to start. Uh, I don't like rack and pull cords. I have a different theory. I'd rather have slightly low compression and let it build while it's running and let it build its compression and build its power. You have working compression that's the saw running you have static compression that means when you're rolling it over by hand how much compression are you building right then that's not the same as running and you got to understand flow where flow starts watch some of the saws that i built in fact most of them you get them in the wood they sound good all of a sudden when you start putting on our load the rpms go up why do they do that? And those of you that's built saws, following my method, notice the same things. Why all of a sudden does it start really pulling? 
because you've increased your efficiency of your engine. You've done it by altering your timing properly. Got your case volumes ample by not screwing with the bottom of the cases. Opening your transfers up. Letting the air get in clean. Letting it get out clean. And let the saw breathe. This is what the whole name of the game is. You've got successes. There's many, many, many of you out there that's building awesome saws. Now, there's people all over building really, really good saws. Uh, they really are. And they are totally different than the way I build. Um, are there inherent problems with them? Oh, yeah. Are they with mine? If I go too far, there are. You can make them hard starting, not want to idle, finicky, hard to adjust, all this stuff. I like to stop before all that happens. I like to not have a race cam on the street. Those of you that took your 68 Camaro and put this big ass camshaft in it and uh, a few more upgrades and you pull up the red light and it quits, you know exactly what I'm talking about. 302 Chevys are one of my favorite motors because they're freaky. I've got two of them. And uh, I'm going to tell you something about 302. It's a real short stroke compared to the bore. They're a three-inch stroke, four-inch bore. The cam that came from the factory of them, they came with a Holley 750 double pumper on a 302. Yes, they did. Uh, you're, a bunch of you are going to remember that. With your four speed and your downshift, boy, and everybody looking at you. And your ride was dictated by how pretty that girl was sitting next to you. Uh huh. That, that's what did it. Mm hmm. It was fun dating them kind of girls, but you don't marry them, do you? So, if you're driving an old AMC Gremlin, you probably didn't get a really nice seat cover. But if you had a 68 Z28 with a 302 with a four-speed, oh, yeah, your seat cover was fine, real fine. She probably couldn't hold a brilliant conversation with you, but they weren't hard to look at, were they? I shouldn't even said all that. All you women out there that were in that category when you were young, God bless you. You made my days. You made my nights. But I didn't marry you, did I? So think about it. I'd rather take a good country girl and and go that direction because they got common sense. Yes. Yeah. Uh-huh. So anyway, with these saws, I'm going to build one at some point here, hopefully sooner than later. We've got a lot of projects started that we haven't been able to finish because life's been getting in the way. When we get everybody's saws out of here that's not mine, we're going to play with this stuff. But I'm going to tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to take this set of cases. And this is going to be a couple months from now or a month or God knows. I am going to fill this area. Oh, God, hard minute you do that, I'm going to fill that at an angle. See that? And I'm going to scoop it to the, from that point to that point. And I'm going to match my transfers right there so that they exactly match that. Well, gee, that's kind of dick, right? You just reduce case volume. I'm improving flow, okay? But I'm going to tell you when I do that, this area right in here is quite strong. I am probably going to remove half of that. And I'm going to fill... The front edge, I'm going to I'm gonna do what I said to the crank, and I'll carry on the journey, and I'll be honest about it. And we're going to fill this area here, this point, so that helps capture that windage when we put an angle on our crank throws. Instead of being a flat across, they're going to be at an angle. Okay? And then we're just going to do a basic piston. A basic piston. Probably a pop-up. I don't know. Uh, they all run good. Here's a pop-up. Okay. Just a basic piston. A highway. 
highway cylinder. And we're going to do it the same as we have every other one. You know, I do alter them. If I know the guy well and I watch him run saws, I can, I know by the way they handle saws what they like. Okay. And I can kind of enhance them characteristics. Okay. Which this is good. But, if I don't know you and I'm building a saw for you, I kind of just split them into the middle of the road. Now, everything I told you, these ain't huge gains or huge losses. It's little ones. This is where you're chasing the pennies to make your dollars, okay? This is where you're doing it. So if you can positively a little here and a little there and a little there and a little there, make tiny little gains adds up to a pretty big cube at the end of the day on top of what you already know how to do right that's what i think about it too okay so with that being said this is going to be a journey with this particular saw like i said common no ceramic bearings no machine work no nothing we're going to build one and we're going to compare it to other 372s that I've got around here with the exact same numbers, exact same parts. We're going to do an honest comparison. That'll be fun, won't it? Uh, is a bigger carburetor necessary? No. Just like on your freaking Camaro. You built this freaking hot rod from Hell Motor and... You put just a little too big carb on it. All run like crazy up on the top end. But you have, you'll develop issues transferring from the low jet to the high jet on your carburetor. This is what you can potentially, especially on shorter stroke saws like 272s. Um, sometimes they don't benefit from a bigger carburetor. It depends on what you've done to the saw. Where have you made increases that allow this to happen? Does it need it? Yes, a lot of times you do. You need a bigger carburetor. Um, but not always. And then after we do this, we test the saw. We're going to take the same saw, try three different ideas of carburetors. We're going to run stock carburetor. We're going to run a mildly modified 372 X torque, which is big, and we're going to run a 390 carburetor. Now, what you'll find out when your carburetor is set up properly, there is differences on your top end. I can already tell you which one's going to do it. It's that 372 X torque carb is going to win the freaking uh, golden monkey. Just trust me. I, I just know it. 390 carb is a safer bet than a 372 X torque. But I like I like tax torques. But if you are not positive of what you're doing with this, run that stock carb. It's gonna run really awesome on your 372. It is. It really is. So when you alter some things, you can increase and have a problem somewhere else from it. I'm trying to get it. Where everybody can see the big picture and wrap it up into a neat little bundle. Okay? And that's only the way I do it. The what I know and what I see. I mean, you would think after 45 years of building two strokes, 35 years of building chainsaws, I've learned one thing somewhere. I have. I have had, way before YouTube, had critics. Well... Why are you doing this? Why are you doing that? I don't like that idea. You're wrong. You're wrong. You're wrong. Well, I know I freaking talk about this an awful lot. And you're probably sick of hearing it. And I started with the motocross bikes. And I learned right there. Now, when you got billion dollar companies spending millions of dollars a year in research every year, just to go racing for 12 minutes, just to win the golden prize, I'm following that guy, okay? That's who I'm following because I can't spend that kind of money, and I, quite frankly, 
don't want to try to re-engineer the wheel. I want what works, and so don't you. So, we're going to make an interesting bottom end. This saw is going to be about bottom end performance gains. Not just what you do with your cylinder and everything and your muffler and, and all this trick stuff and fancy air filters, which I never use. Uh, I, I can't. I, I like logging. I like we're cutting firewood. Yeah, I don't want something in my way. So, when we're done with this, let's send this out to Tin Man. What do you think? Nice seeing you again. I know it's been two weeks. I'll try to get another video in, in a couple days. Monday, Tuesday. Uh... I have a lot going on right now, so bear with me. Those of you that I've built saws for and you haven't seen them on video, it has been too hot, and I really, really am not going out there and run five, six saws in the heat like this. I'm just not. Uh, it's not going to help me a bit. We have a cool down coming. We're going to get it in there. Let's make some exciting videos about cutting. I haven't done one in a very long time. And get them saws back to you people. Thank you so much for stopping in. Goodbye.